Hello and welcome to The Take with Sophie Ridge, live at nine here in the heart of Westminster. Well, in the east of Ukraine, the barrage is continuing without let up. Russian aggression and the war in Ukraine has completely transformed how we view global threats. And that's meant big questions for NATO, about membership, about troops and weapons. And it's also meant big questions here at home about defence spending and whether or not it needs to increase. So there is plenty for us to get stuck into as we bring you takes from all sides over the next 60 minutes. We're seeing expansion of uh, the alliance, which is exactly the opposite of what Putin wanted. He wanted less NATO, he's getting more. The PM was with other Western leaders as NATO confirmed a big increase in forces. And that meant, at PMQs, it was the deputies in charge. I gently point out to her that we want this Prime Minister to go on a lot longer than she wants the leader of the Labour Party to yeah. go on. The Honourable Member, when the situation in Afghanistan on a sun lounger. That's where the Honourable Member was. Pretty electric her exchange as Dominic Raab stood in for Boris Johnson and Angela Rainer, Rainer deputised for Keir Starmer. We'll find out what our viewers panel made of PMQs too. Uh, there they are. We can have a look at them. Hello, everyone. Quick wave uh, if you can hear me. We will be hearing uh, more from the panel uh, later on uh, on the programme. We'll also have some top guests, including the Home Office Safeguarding Minister, Rachel McLean, the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Pat McFadden. We'll be talking to the former Deputy Chief of the Defence Staff, Sir Simon Mayle. Plus, we'll be talking to the Labour MP, Rosie Duffield. Plus, much more decides. All coming up on The Take. Good evening. Well, we're often told that keeping people safe is the first responsibility of government. How much to spend on defence has always been a thorny subject, now more than ever, as the world feels more dangerous than it has in decades. Well, it's top of the agenda today in Madrid, where the PM is meeting other NATO leaders. There's plenty of domestic politics, though, too, whether it's Scottish independence, the start of the parliamentary investigation into Partygate, and a debate over whether abortion should be part of the British Bill of Rights. So, let's crack straight on. We're going to start with the best bits of the week so far. What we're going to be doing now is, is talking about what more we can do as an alliance to support the Ukrainians. I gently point out to her that we want this Prime Minister to go on a lot longer than she wants the leader of the Labour Party yeah. to go on. Where was the Honourable Member when the situation in Afghanistan on a sun lounger? That's where the Honourable Member was. I take no lectures from the Honourable when it comes to doing your job. What I will never do is allow Scottish democracy to be a prisoner of Boris Johnson or any yeah. Prime Minister. Will you block, block her plans to have another referendum? We, you can take it, put it this way, we certainly think that uh, our plan for a stronger economy works better when the UK is together. If uh, Vladimir Putin was hoping uh, that he would be getting less NATO on... Uh, on his western uh, front as a result of his uh, unprovoked illegal invasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, he's been proved completely wrong. I'd revel in the opportunity for the people of this country to have more than just by-elections to see what they think of this government opposite. Will the government back my bill to ban the use of NDAs in cases of sexual harassment, bullying and misconduct? Will he accept the cross-party amendment to his forthcoming Bill of Rights, which enshrines a woman's right to choose in law? <laughs> Well, plenty for the Prime Minister to think about and, of course, for the government uh, to assess too. We can talk now to our first guest, the Home Office Minister for Safeguarding, Rachel McLean, on the programme. Thank you very much for being uh, with us uh, today. Um, I just want to start by talking about Ukraine. Uh, we're Big global affairs, mm. huge uh, day to day with NATO effectively reassessing uh, its defence capability in the light of that Russian aggression, uh, whether it's membership, whether it's troop numbers. Given the war and, and given the aggression from Russia, do we need to look at increasing defence spending in the UK as well? Well, clearly, it's an incredibly dangerous period that we are facing, and that's why the Prime Minister is is there speaking to. NATO allies and at this stage we must all work together with our international partners 
Um, Putin has decided to, to turn himself into an aggressor, threatening a sovereign and peaceful democratic nation. And what he succeeded in doing is uniting G7 and NATO partners in, in, in our mission to defeat him and to defend Ukraine. So on, on the question of spending, I mean, clearly, uh, in order to defend our nation, freedom isn't free. We do have to spend money. Um, and that's why it is important that we are spending our, our NATO commitments. We're spending that percentage of GDP which we've committed to doing. But we, we will always, always need to look at our security posture and, and how we fund our armed forces. But I think if you look at the commitment that we've given, the weapons, the assistance that we've given to the Ukraine in order to help them defeat Putin, I think we have been at the forefront of military aid there in the UK. We should be proud of that. So just looking at the threat level, which I think we can agree has mm. clearly gone up uh, mm. recently, looking at what Russia's been capable of doing. The question, I guess, is about the response to that. Ben Wallace told uh, Kay Burley this morning that his settlement was done before Russia invaded Ukraine. Yeah. Russia is very, very dangerous on the world stage. The world is less secure than it was two, three years ago, and it is not looking likely to change for the rest of the decade. That is the moment in the middle of the decade to say we should commit to increased funding. Do you agree with him? Well, look, I think Ben Wallace, is, it is his job as a Secretary of State for Defence to call for more spending and to make sure that we are defending our nation. Um, I think what the Secretary of State for Defence is saying, that he's... He, he's got the settlement that he's got at the moment, which actually is the biggest that the armed services have had since the end of but the Cold War. But he's basically saying but it's not going to be enough going yeah, forward of, because of it was done before Russia and Great uh, Ukraine. Absolutely. And, and the world has changed and we must always continue to, to review that. But one thing is for sure, we will defend Ukraine's right to exist. We've been at the forefront of, of the defence efforts to protect Ukraine, the Ukrainian citizens, uh, not only with weapons, but also with the other types of assistance that enables them to get food to their citizens and we'll continue to doing that. OK. Uh, now, um, with your uh, hat on, the Safeguarding Minister mm. hat on, uh, the Metropolitan Police has been put in special measures. Is it fit for purpose? I think it's a really worrying time. And I have to say that in my role, I work with some absolutely brilliant Met officers. And it is really important to say that. Uh, there are incredibly good people who can come forward to serve in the Met Police. But look, we agree. We agree with the Inspectorate's report. That's why we have supported it. We expect the police to focus on the basics. We expect them to focus on keeping the streets safe and, and tackling crime. So it is right that, that this process has started and they must be held to account and now the Mayor of London does really need to step up and, and get a grip on this improvement. You, you say it's worrying. What, what really in particular is worrying you? Well, look, you know, the inspector has come forward and will come forward with the report. But we've we've all seen, of course, we've all seen what's in the media. We're all aware of the, the tragic events surrounding Sarah Everard's murder, many other cases, the officers in Charing Cross, and that's just to name but a few. And some of the failings are, are, are widespread. They're, they're well documented. And, and it's clear that we expect the police to do that basic job of protecting the public. And are they doing that? There, do there, there, there are clearly some problems there, which is why the inspectorate has put them into this process. And, so, now, and now we really do need the process, uh, those, those governance and accountability measures to, to take place. It's more than some problems, though, isn't it? I mean, look, you know, had a serving police officer murder uh, Sarah Everard. Mm. As you said, the messages sent by people in Charing Cross, I mean, this is like joking about domestic violence. Most of the things, you know, I read those messages, they're absolutely sick. They are, they are. They must have felt sick to read Absolutely. It. They're absolutely horrific and completely unacceptable. Sarah Sex is a problem with the Met and so, so if you if you just look at what the Home Secretary has done, she has immediately commissioned a review on that, the events following Sarah Everard's murder. We do take that incredibly seriously. Do you think there is a sexism problem in the Met Police? Well, I think it's not for me to comment. It is obviously we have seen evidence of sexism and we must deal with that. And I think the Met themselves have said that's unacceptable and they must root it out. But we do need them to now set out a plan of how they intend to tackle these problems, whether it's sexism, whether it's any other problems, because actually we expect a police force in London, our biggest police force, that, by the way, is receiving record amounts of funding, uh, rece receiving funding to recruit new officers. We must make sure that it's fit for purpose. Is it fit for purpose right now? Well, what we've seen at the moment is some severe failings are set out in the process. So, obviously, so, no. it, it, needs to imp it needs to improve. And now, I just want to talk to you a bit about abortion, because, of mm. course, we've seen this, the overturning of Roe versus Wade in the States, so the landmark ruling that made abortion mm. legal there. Now, 
it's obviously shaken a lot of women as a result, and um, some Labour MPs are now calling for the right to an abortion to be included in the British Bill of Rights. Is that something that you personally would like to see? So, what we see in, in this country is we have a settled position on abortion. Uh, when it's brought forward to Parliament, it is a matter of conscience. It's always a free vote. And I think that system has served us well. I would be reluctant, actually, for the reasons that the Deputy Prime Minister set out today at Prime Minister's questions, to bring it into a judicial system whereby it's litigated within the courts. And why, why is that? Just explain to people who might not watch PMQs why. Well, I think that what we have here is a system where elected representatives can set the law around abortion. We have a system in the United Kingdom that, that preserves those rights of women to have an abortion. That's a settled position. It's existed for a very long time. And that, I believe, safeguards the rights of women to have an abortion. I believe, that's my personal view, it should be a free choice, and I've always voted for the rights of women to have an abortion. It is always a free vote. It's always a matter of conscience when it comes to Parliament. And I think that's the right way for it to be settled in this country. I mean, I guess, you know, you say it should be MPs, effectively, who decide. I just mm. want to read to you the words of Danny Kruger, a Conservative MP, who said that some of his parliamentary colleagues think that women have an absolute right to bodily autonomy in this matter, whereas I think, in the case of abortion, that right is qualified by the fact that another body is involved. Are you comfortable that, with that, that women don't have an absolute right to bodily autonomy? I think on a subject like this, it's an incredibly sensitive subject, and people are able to disagree respectfully within Parliament, but I guess, ultimately... I guess that's why some people think that actually having MPs decide on the right to abortion makes them nervous, because they effectively don't necessarily always trust the decision that some MPs will come up with. MPs reflect democracy. They if, reflect the wishes of their constituents. We've had a settled position on abortion. We have a settled way of it being available to women uh, in this country. It's a fundamental part of healthcare in this country. It will remain so, and I believe that that is the right way to continue to protect those rights of women if they want to have an abortion. OK, thank you so much for being on the programme. Uh, good you. to talk. Rachel McLean uh, there talking to us today. Well, as you saw a little earlier at the beginning of the programme, it was Labour's deputy leader who was standing in for her boss, Keir Starmer, at Prime Minister's Questions today. And that meant that it was the deputy Prime Minister, Dominic Raab, who had a bit of fun, claiming she was more interested in getting his job, and she gave plenty back as well, accusing him of being on a sun lounger uh, during the Afghanistan crisis last summer. Well, we can talk to uh, Pat McFadden now and get Labour's take, uh, the party shadow chief secretary to the Treasury. Thank you very much for being uh, with us. Mm -hmm. um, we've been talking about the war in Ukraine uh, and the Russian aggression on the programme uh, today. Now, Labour has said it would support an increase in defence spending. What increase do you, are you calling for? Russia's invasion of Ukraine has caused every country, I believe, to have to re-examine uh, its assumptions about defence, its needs and its capabilities. In Germany, they call this the turning point. Uh, they're in a very different position from us. Uh, but I think every country needs to do that afterwards, and that's what we would do in government. It's what we did when we were in government before, when we had a sustained increase in defence spending. Uh, and it's often said in Parliament, the first duty of government is to protect its citizens. That's what we believe, uh, that's what we'll do, uh, and that's our position. On so it. what level should it rise to, then? You can't pick a level now, because I think you've got to have a proper assessment of your needs and capabilities. We're committed to the 2% uh, that NATO wants. We're very committed to NATO. NATO was that's founded what, I mean, that's the, what the, the government's effectively committed to meeting the late NATO targets as well. I'm just trying to unpick, you know, you say it should be a turning point, that there should be an increase in defence funding. What's the level? You know, Ben Wallace reportedly wants 2.5% of GDP by 2028. That's another target for, you know, 0.5% plus inflation. What, what's Labour's position? Well, there's lots of targets around. What so, you... so what is Labour's target? Our position is you've got to have a proper fundamental strategic defence review of your needs and capabilities. You do that in government and then you decide your budget. But one thing is clear. We will protect the British public and we will fulfil our responsibilities to NATO, which we're very proud to have played a big role in founding with the post-war Labour government. It's difficult, though, if you can't come up with a number, isn't it? To... I don't think so. I think it would be a bit facile, to be honest, to come up with a number here with you when uh, we haven't done the strategic defence review that we'd need to do in government. That's the right way to do this. OK. Uh, now, 
just talking about abortion for a minute, um, it, again, it came up in the House of Commons early today at Prime Minister's Questions. It's, it's a very live topic after the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Uh, Stella Creasy, the Labour MP, is calling for the fundamental right to an abortion to be included in the British Bill of Rights. Do you support that? This has uh, always been an individual issue in Parliament, uh, not a party whipped issue. It's important to say that so that the viewers know that I'm giving you my view, not necessarily you know, the rest of the Labour Party's view. The view I've always taken as a legislator is that there should be legal provision for abortion in the country. Uh, that's what the law of the land should be. That's the way I've always voted on this issue. And if we have future votes on it, I expect that's the way that I will vote uh, again. I think the Supreme Court decision taken in the United States last week is a hugely retrograde step that will cause enormous difficulty and pain for women in the United States. I wouldn't like to see uh, us go to that position here, so I think it's important that we maintain safe and legal provision for abortion in this country, and that's the way I would vote in Parliament. OK, OK. Uh, it's interesting, different takes from you and Rachel McLean, both, of course, uh, supporting the right to abortion, but I guess it's different uh, routes to getting there. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the Labour Party, because um, Tony Blair said this week on a podcast, I support what Keir Starmer is doing. He has moved the party significantly. The central problem is what are the ideas that are going to stop this relegation and put the UK on an upward path? Jeremy Corbyn took over the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, became a Brexit party, the strong centre ground that you need to drive practical, radical solutions was weakened. There has been a gaping great hole where ideas should be. Do you agree with that, that there's been a gaping great hole where ideas should be? I'll tell you where I think there's a situation vacant in British politics for a party that combines enthusiasm for wealth creation and prosperity with social justice. That's where the Labour Party is at its best. That's where I think we should plant our flag. A, a big reason why the country is facing a lot of the problems that it's facing right now with the cost of living and inflation and so on is a lack of economic growth over many, many years, not just over a year or two, over many years. That's made us less prosperous. It's made us more vulnerable. So what we've got to do is combine that enthusiasm for prosperity and wealth creation with the things that the Labour Party's always believed in, good public services, a good NHS, uh, a good education system and so on. We're the party of both social justice and prosperity and that's where we should plant our flag. It's, you, that's where we should plant our flag. Do you not think Keir Starmer has already planted the flag in that position then? He's engaged in a huge process of transformation. Last week uh, we had the best by-election result that we've had in 10 years. We had the best vote that we had in Wakefield for 20 years, so we've made huge progress. <laughs> progress, but of course yes, but there's Sir more to do. Sir Keir Starmer also told the New Statesman this week uh, that we're starting from scratch, the slate is wiped clean. I mean, he's been Labour leader for two years. Don't you think you need to... When are you going to start filling in the slate? Well, we've got plenty of policies. The government's just adopted our policy on the windfall tax. Of course there's more to come. What Keir Starmer's saying by that is that the programme that we fought and failed to win uh, on in 2019 is clearly not going to be the programme going forward. But you need of to come up with that, another programme. Of course that's true. So we are uh, making great progress since that terrible defeat uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, and everybody knows there is more to do to get ourselves into a winning position. I would say we're in a competitive position right now, which is great progress, but of course we've got more to do. OK, thank you very much for being on the uh, programme. Uh, Pat thank McFadden uh, there. So. We've now heard from both the government and Labour, so we can try and work out a little bit of what we uh, learned, where we're standing uh, so far. We can talk, uh, as usual, to our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates. Sam, good to see you. What were your main takeaways from the interviews so far? Well, oddly enough, despite the big issues that are being discussed, Scottish independence, dispense spending, the thing that's most live, it strikes me in the Commons today even, mm. is the issue of abortion, suddenly back on the agenda because of the verdict on Friday from the US Supreme Court uh, overturning Roe v Wade. Now, this has led MPs actually in all parties to question whether Britain's own abortion laws are strong enough, whether or not they too could be overturned. Now, the British right to abortion was enshrined in the 1967 Act that currently allows uh, abortion up to 24 weeks. The question that's being posed by Stella Creasy and some other MPs is whether or not, instead of there being certain circumstances in which it's legal, 
whether or not there should just be a fundamental right, and that attached to the new Bill of Rights that Dominic Raab is proposing. So that's the debate you're going to hear about. But it's un important to understand the criticism that the government has of that. They worry that if this is introduced and there is a right to an abortion, then that right might conflict with some of the other rights, even in the Bill of Rights, which would say, for instance, that there's a right to life. And if those two things are challenged, it would end up in court and it would be for a judge to decide which was more important, the right to life or the right to an abortion. And there is a worry amongst ministers that this issue of abortion could end up in the courts rather than decided by elected politicians. And that would actually take us further down the American route rather than sticking to the system that we have at the moment. I did genuinely find it quite interesting actually talking to both Rachel McLean and um, Pat McFadden, who I think have basically the same view on abortion and, and very genuinely held views too, that they believe in the right to abortion, but just different ways of trying to enshrine that right and protecting it effectively. That's right. And I think that most MPs that I talk to believe that there is a consensus around the current situation. But the problem is that you start to unpick that and you never quite know where you're going to end up. Interesting stuff. Uh, Sam, uh, always good to talk, we'll talk uh, to you later on the programme uh, as uh, well. Now, some uh, breaking sporting news. Oh, no, sorry. Apologies. That was... <laughs> if you are watching the tennis or interested in tennis, pause that. That was a wrong... Auto cue, so don't worry, it's still live. We will bring you the Andy Murray result as soon as we have it, don't worry. In the meantime, we'll go to the break. <laughs> Back to the politics uh, now, and it was a very lively uh, Prime Minister's questions, as it always is uh, when uh, Angela Rayner uh, is facing off against uh, Dominic Raab. We can find out uh, what, uh, how it went down with our viewers' uh, panel, our regular panel of viewers that we have on the show. There they all are. Good to see everybody. Now, we've got people from across the UK and also critically uh, across the political uh, spectrum, so it tends to be a great snapshot, I guess, of what people uh, are thinking. And I'm really interested to know uh, what you made uh, of today's uh, PMQ's uh, session. Let, let's go to Hannah Underwood first, uh, shall we? Now, uh, Hannah is a Labour supporter. Uh, you are from Hartford, aren't you, Hannah? Uh, what did you make of the two understudies? I thought it was really lively. I really enjoyed it. Quite invigorating, really, political debate. If I had to pick a winner, I'd probably say that Angela Rayner really uh, sunk some points home. She, she commented about Boris Johnson fleeing the country. She's talking about high taxes that everybody's uh, suffering at the moment. And I think, yeah, she scored the most points. Uh, so Hannah reckons uh, that it was Angela Rayner who came out on top. Tim, let's talk to Tim Warren next, shall we? Tim, you describe yourself as a progressive centrist. You're coming, uh, talking to us from Dorset. Who do you think came out on top? I think, uh, I think Angela Rayner probably came out on top. What started as quite a light-hearted, um, humorous exchange, but there are outcomes from the, from the uh, exchange, and particularly the wink. There was a wink from Dominic Raab, and I just think that sums up how out of touch the government are. Um, was it condescending? Was it machismo? Was it sexist? But completely unacceptable. And he was sort of suggesting that she was wrong to enjoy the arts. Somebody from her background was wrong to enjoy the arts, drinking champagne within the law, as opposed to industrial law breaking at the heart of government associated with Partygate. Yeah, interesting. So the wink was a big part of it. I have to say, I was trying to work out if he was winking at Angela Rayner or if he was winking at someone else on the opposite front bench. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Next time he's on the show, I'm going to try and ask him because the wink definitely stood out to me uh, as well, I have to say. Right, let's bring in John uh, Comerford, shall we? You're a Conservative supporter. You're talking to us from uh, Kent. Um, what did you make of today's PMQs? Did you enjoy it? I thought it was entertaining, but... Personally, I didn't think there was a winner either side. I think there was too much to and fro in, and uh, I just didn't enjoy it. I thought it was like going to the theatre to see a play and the understudies taking part instead of the stars, and uh, it just didn't—it just didn't do it for me today. And do you think that was just because you knew that they are not, you know, the top dogs, if you like, or because you just thought the—I guess—the debate itself wasn't quite up to scratch? I, I thought the debate was very good. I, I thought there was too many personal far away from both sides. Um, I'm not a great fan, I must confess, of either, either Dominic Rago or Angela Rayner, but uh, 
I don't think there was a winner out of the two of them, as far as I'm concerned. There you go. Uh, right, I want to bring in uh, Roy now. Roy Royer, a Conservative voter, talking to, to us from Kent. Now, Roy, I'm interested, what did you make of the wink? What did you think of uh, the, the infamous Dominic Rav wink? I thought it was quite funny. Um, and I also thought immediately it happened that there are going to be people who are going to call it sexist, they're going to call it misogynistic, they're going to call it... Uh, it's all pretty facile, really. It's, it's, um, um, it was just funny. Um, I thought he hit, a, he, he hit a good point. Like you, apparently, he wasn't winking at her. He was winking at somebody else who made a comment that she had just made, and it was, it was almost acquiescence. Yes, that's, that's, that's a good point. Very funny. So Angela Rayner is very, very good at weaponising class, at weaponising, um, and I think going back onto the Glyndebourne thing, that's what Dominic Raab was really talking about, the hypocrisy of on the one minute saying you're all posh, this and that, and then at the next minute sitting there drinking champagne at Glyndebourne when she should be trying to sort out the rail worker strike. So, uh, yeah, um, winner, loser. It was very entertaining. I don't think there was a particular winner either way, but it, it was very entertaining. I did enjoy it, I must admit. Um, for once, I thought most of the time it was about politics. It was about playing the ball, not the man or woman, sorry. Um, so uh, in, in, that in that regard, I thought it was quite good. Um, and then the debate on abortion, I thought, um, was, was uh, well had. I Interesting. Uh, we'll be talking about that uh, debate on abortion uh, later on as well. We've got D Rosie Duffield uh, on uh, the programme. It did feel like a particularly electric PMQs, I guess, didn't it? Um, let's talk to Hannah now, shall we? Hannah Walker, uh, you're uh, also talking to us from uh, Dorset. You're a Labour supporter. Is Angela Rayner your cup of tea, Hannah? I think she's, <coughs> excuse me, I think she's considerably better at the dispatch box than um, Keir Starmer. And I think her reposts are much quicker and much more to the point than he makes. He reads from a script. I actually thought that today's um, <clears throat> exchanges were a lot better than, than usual. Um, and I thought the understudies were better than the main acts. Um, I also thought that if we're talking about hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of accusing Angela Rayner of going to the opera, um, to do that legally as opposed to the many, many illegal parties in Downing Street was, was a bit much. But I thought I thought the exchange was much more um, appropriate and they both, I didn't think I'd say this about Dominic Robb, but they, they both seem to know their brief and they seem to have a respect for each other, which is sadly missing most of the time on the floor of the Commons. Yeah, I think I agree with you there. It's funny, isn't it? Because in some ways, Angela Rayner and Dominic Raab, you'd think they would be at it like cats and dogs, that they would, you know, hate each other. But they seem to have a... They both seem to be quite enjoying it today, even though they definitely got stuck in on some of those points. Uh, right, let's finally, let's bring in uh, Belinda Campbell, shall we? You're a swing voter. Uh, you're talking to us from Twickenham in South West London. Uh, what was your take on today's Prime Minister's questions? I would say that Angela won on feistiness. She was all revved up. And um, Dominic won on being cool, calm and collected. And I could imagine him as the prime minister. I wasn't so sure about Angela, <laughs> um, but she definitely was revved up, fired up. And uh, he took it well. He's very calm and collected. And that's a quality that um, is good as well. So I don't know who won. I think they won for different reasons. So they both won. And I think that... You know, you hear the same subjects coming up and um, facts are repeated and you just think, OK, let's see some action, not just hear all the facts all the time. We want to see things change. Interesting stuff. Well, it felt like the majority uh, of you uh, enjoyed it today. Quite a lot of praise for both sides, a bit of cross-party support. Uh, interesting to see uh, from the understudies. Thank you very much, as always, from a really, really uh, entertaining uh, panel. Now, if you do want to join our viewers' panel as well and to give your take uh, live right here on Sky News, it's really easy to do so. Uh, all you have to do is to email the take with Sophie Ridge at sky.uk. The take with Sophie Ridge at sky.uk and include your name, your phone number, a little bit about your political opinions as well. Really important because we want to hear all perspectives and takes on how the world works. So don't be afraid to get in touch and you could hear back uh, from the team uh, shortly. I do hope you'll uh, consider that. Now it's been a really important week away from, of uh, global from response.
uh, to continuous enhanced uh, forward presence. As you know, the UK is there in, in Estonia. Uh, we're there in Poland. We've, uh, we're helping out in, uh, in Romania. We're, we're there policing. We've got uh, ships in the eastern Mediterranean. We're moving uh, support uh, to that area. But what we're also doing with uh, the Eastern European countries, with the Baltics, uh, is offering long-term uh, support, partnership, to help them uh, build up their defences and, and make sure that they can repel any attack immediately. There you go. Wasn't actually expecting that, but actually quite uh, timely, <laughs> considering our uh, next guest. Um, you can see there the Prime Minister talking there at the NATO summit about what needs to be done to try and bolster the support uh, for uh, some of the people in the, of course, affected uh, region. And our next guest, we can certainly talk uh, about uh, some of those really important uh, issues uh, with. Uh, we're joined now by a man who knows a thing or two about the armed forces and geopolitics, <laughs> the former Deputy Chief of the Defence Staff, uh, the MOD Senior Advisor and Overseas Envoy for the Prime Minister, Sir Simon Mayle. Thank you so much for being... Not at all, Sophie. Lovely to see you. ...with us. Um, I'm really interested to get your <clears> take <throat> on what is happening in Ukraine, because it felt, feels to me... Like we had, you know, some months where the story was really about Russian failures, you know, mm -hmm. failures to take Kyiv, a failure to make progress. Yeah. Whereas, more recently, they have had some successes in the east, haven't they? What is the current situation? Is Russia? They have. I, I, I think t tactically, and you've you've covered it many times, Sophie. The ineptitude of the Russians, their complete disregard for casualties, their own or civilian casualties, has been hugely highlighted. You know, very, very large you know, body bag count, very, very large numbers of tanks destroyed, uh, real exposure of their failures in command and control, etc. But operationally, you know, they have great depth. Um, the Russians historically have a great capacity for suffering. Um, you know, whether it's the Second World War or whether it's, uh, you know, the, the Soviet Union, they, their capacity to just keep bulldozing on or steamrolling. Is there? We must not underestimate the uh, Putin's determination to get something out of this, and we should not again underestimate how important what he's got already is the Donbass, um, Mariupol, the ports there. What he has obviously failed to do is either overthrow the government, take Kiev, uh, or take Odessa, and I think that's going to be beyond him. Mm. But uh, then strategically, we're in the business of how much are the consequences of the invasion going to play out, or the consequences of the, sa the sanctions against the invasion. Um, as, as, that, as, that, as we move through the year. And it's very difficult to see a, a really comfortable outcome, even though support is there in NATO. Mm -hmm. I think the Madrid summit's been an extraordinary change in, in the last, you know, take five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but issues to do with China, issues to do with the African Union, issues to do with India. You've just got to keep opening the aperture and getting a bigger map. I, I'm interested when you were saying about the Russian determination to get something yeah. out of it. And I think it, you're obviously uh, saying that, you know, they've had to recalibrate some of their ambitions. But does it feel inevitable that Russia will take the Donbass and do you think they will effectively try and hold on to that? Uh, yeah, yes, I do. And, and now all, all the, in, the, the intelligence expertise will tell you if we continue to arm, train the Ukrainians, we may reach a stage where the Russians are so eroded because they've, you know, they've put everything in the front window it's been suffered an enormous amount of attrition. We could get to a position in nine months, that's a long way away, in which the Ukrainians would be able to go onto the offensive. Now, whether they, it's an offensive that could take back the Donbass. And, you know, you are left with a very, very tricky long-term problem. And the question, I guess, some people may say that, look, we cannot reward Russian aggression. They should not be allowed to keep no. any Ukrainian territory. And it's really important to send that signal. Others, I guess, may argue, look, we need to end this war and end the suffering. Would a compromise be to allow Russia to keep well, the Donbass? What's the answer? Well, well, this, of course, is where General Patrick Sanders, a, a very old friend of mine who I have great confidence in as the new chief, talks about 1937. Mm. It's in between the Rhinelands, Crimea, and the Sudetenlands, let Russian aggression mm. hold on to the Donbass. Mm. And the question then is, do we go into 1939, an all-out war, or do we step back to a sort of 32, where we, we manage this? What, what's um, your take? I, of course, I would, I would want us to go back to 32. Mm. But the, it, it is a very difficult one, and we keep talking about... We see solidarity now, but if you take that nine-month time frame in which the Ukrainians could go onto the offensive, that's an, awful lot of, that's an awful lot of water to go under the bridge in terms of famine, control of grain supplies, 
fertilizers, energy shortages, uh, cost of living crisis, you know, and, and we all know that, um, you know, just historically, uh, you get hunger problems or rise of staples, you get social unrest, you get political implications. So, really, really wicked problem, as we describe it, for our policymakers, and not a good time to be hitting us post COVID with a sort of, a, as I say, you know, you know, deficits, debts, etc. Given the government has mm. committed to support Ukraine, mm. do we need to increase defence spending, also in light, of course, of Russian aggression? Uh, I would argue yes, uh, in the sense that the government is to choose. We've had a sort of 30-year holiday from history. Uh, we have taken the peace dividend all the way back to 91, uh, reinvested in the welfare state, all sorts of things I totally understand. But eventually, grown-up governments, mature democracies, need to, need to work out where they're going to prioritise mm -hmm. and explain it to a population. Now, it, this is not for Britain alone. Um, and as we, we've been better than most, I think, in, in con you know, continuing to invest in, in our armed forces. Mm -hmm. Many of our European colleagues, I'm afraid, have been free riders. Mm -hmm. The difference, I would argue, again, of course, between 1937 and now, if you're, if you're going to use an analogy, is, of course, then it was a very weakened League of Nations. Luckily, we still have NATO, which very much is underpinned by American, uh, American, uh, you know, power and might. On that, uh, Sir Kim Darrick, the former National Security Advisor, wrote in the Telegraph this week that NATO should prepare for the risk that Vladimir Putin may, at some point, resort to nuclear weapons. Do you think that he could be prepared to use them, and could the UK potentially be a target? I would suspect UK wouldn't be a target. Uh, that is complete speculation. Mm -hmm. But the, the levels of escalation for the Russians and the Soviets before them, compared to ours, has always, what can I say, grayed the area between conventional mm -hmm. weaponry, unconventional weaponry, chemical weapons, and even nuclear. So I would not... You'd have to factor in the mentality of, of Putin his armed forces, this sense of grievance, this sense of being cornered, this sense of being, you know, Western ganging up on the Russians and that, and that sort of mystical, transcendental approach they have to uh, the blood and soil of Russia. So it is worrying, but it, we should absolutely at least bear it in mind as a, as a possibility, uh, really, sadly. Really important uh, stuff. Thank you so much for being on the programme and really uh, giving us that insight into uh, this global matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, it's our regular chance to speak to Backbench MP as we pick our PMQ of the week. That's the one that really caught our eye uh, during the session earlier. And today, it's this one. So far this year, 52 women have been killed in the UK. Our rights to free speech, safe spaces, mm. fairness in sport, and even yeah. the words we use to describe our own bodies are mm. all under threat. Mm. Yeah. Will the Deputy awesome. Prime Minister send a clear signal, as some of his Cabinet colleagues have done this week, that Britain respects the rights of women? And will he accept the cross-party amendment to his forthcoming Bill of Rights, which enshrines a woman's right to choose in law? Yeah. Mr Duffield there. Now, of course, usually the questioner doesn't get a chance to respond uh, to the answer uh, they got. Uh, the idea is we're going to try and put that right. Each week, uh, let an MP do just that. Now, the question was from Rosie Duffield, the Labour MP for Canterbury, uh, who joins us now. Good to have you on the programme. And now, uh, you alluded to lots of the sort of current debates about women's rights mm. in uh, the question there. Um, but with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, it feels right to really focus on uh, the abortion issue. Yeah. Uh, many people are going to be concerned about it. Mm. Why do you think that we need a specific right to abortion in the UK? Because we don't have that. I think a lot of people think that that is enshrined in UK law, that right to choose body autonomy, but it isn't. We have laws that go back, you know, they go back over 50 years, which say that you can only be prosecuted in circum certain circumstances if you do have an abortion. They're completely out of date, but, but having it enshrined... Some of us in the No Party feel that, and across the House actually feel that having it enshrined in this so-called Bill of Rights might be a way of just of just getting it down and, and putting it on the statute books for once and for all. No, you didn't get the 
PM's answer, because obviously he no. was out of the country. What did you make of Dominic Raab's uh, response to you? I think it was pretty measured. He was very kind to me, which, which I wasn't expecting. But, um, but I understand his argument is going to be that actually we don't need it to end up in a, in a potential courtroom situation. But I think given your introduction and given that women are feeling at the moment so worried about this, you know, OK, it's America, we've got a very different political setup. but there's that saying, isn't there, that when America sneezes, Britain catches a cold. And a lot of women are really frightened about this and we've seen some things in the house this week that have made them even more nervous that people are out there to try and overturn their rights. Um, you mentioned there about uh, Dominic Raab talking about it getting snarled up in the courts and actually you know I spoke to Rachel McLean earlier on the program who is someone who is you know pro-abortion rights but she said that she believes in the current yeah. situation. Is there a worry uh, that if it is effectively put in the Bill of Rights, uh, then, you know, it's something that could be then challenged in the courts and it could be judges who decide it rather than MPs. Yeah, I mean, that is an issue, of course it is, but the Bill of Rights is something that obviously the Labour Party disagree with. It's been banging around for quite a few years now. Michael Gove, I think, first introduced the idea. And we're not going to stop that Bill of Rights. There are supporters who are saying, why are you putting down amendments? We're, we're against this as a, as a party and membership. But we've got to try and water it down somehow. And it feels as though it might be a gateway to eroding those rights. Just getting them on paper would make lots of women feel more secure, at least. You say about you, you worried about the rights being eroded. I, I mm. guess, is that because you feel that many women have looked at what's happened in the States yeah. and thought, you know, th these are things that we thought were decided and it, yeah, it's things that absolutely. can be quite fragile? And... One of my colleagues raised a point that if a British woman goes on holiday in America, maybe not knowing she's pregnant, perhaps in the early stages, and might have suffer with an ectopic pregnancy or a complication that just to get treated in America would probably make your insurance null and void and they could even refuse treatment. That's actually an issue for British women or people from around the world who might happen to be pregnant and going on holiday. So it does affect other women, not just not just Americans, but there are a lot of Americans very affected. Mm. And currently it's legal in the UK to have an abortion up to uh, 24 weeks of yeah. pregnancy. If you were going to include this fundamental right to abortion in a Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. would that time limit still be the same? No, there wouldn't be a time limit on that, but that's not actually what we're thrashing out and talking about. And all of these things are sort of up to people to vote with their conscience. It's, it's a free vote, so, so parties this... wouldn't vote, but that bit wouldn't be in it. We're, that we're feels not talking quite about important, that. I guess, doesn't it? So does that mean that under the legislation you would be able to have an abortion right up throughout your pregnancy? I doubt it. I doubt we'd go that far. But at this stage, I mean, there isn't even a date set for the second reading yet of this Bill of Rights. So I think we're way off kind of thrashing out those details. But at the moment, not, we're not doing that. Are you worried, though, that some people might find it more difficult to support it if they felt that it would open the door, I guess, to later-term yeah, abortions? Yeah, I'd absolutely understand that. And that is something we need to discuss in the House in detail. And we need to try and do it in a way that protects everyone's right to an opinion. It is an opinion and it's a feeling and often people's religious identity is very caught up in that and I respect that completely. Mm. What, what have you made of the you know, debate in the House? Because there has been, I guess, some attention uh, given, shall we say, yeah. to uh, some mm. of the comments by MPs. In the debate. I absolutely understand. I was raised a Catholic. It would be very difficult for me personally to have a termination, but I'm really privileged compared to some of the women in America who don't have a choice. And there's also issues like rape. You know, why should a woman be forced to do that? And my belief is, as an MP, I have to put the rights of my constituents and all women who are affected before my own religious upbringing, which, you know, is a matter for my conscience. And I, th I think all of us have to have to feel like that when we're MPs. Have you it's had, a tricky one. Have you had any direction from the Labour leadership about, about um, Labour's position? Not or? yet, but I think he did make a comment, didn't he, when, when this was overturned, that he was supportive of women's rights, as did the Prime Minister. OK. Thank you very much for being on the programme. Thank really you. interesting to talk about you know, such a, a, a huge issue and something that lots yeah. of MPs I know feel very strongly about. Thanks. You're watching The Take. Uh, you, we are live in Westminster. Up next, we're going to be rounding up everything we've heard and do a bit of post-match analysis. <laughs> Hello, welcome back live to Westminster. You're watching... The take. Well, we've had lots of takes this evening on a whole range of different subjects, from Ukraine to abortion and to winking Dominic Raab. Uh, let's have a little post-match roundup, shall we, with our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, who is here again. No winking, please, uh, on the programme, Sam. Uh, now, uh, it's interesting, isn't it, because 
If you rewind to those by-elections, which was a week ago, right, most prime ministers would not have survived losing uh, those two by-elections, one of the biggest swings, or I think the biggest swing we've ever had in a by-election. And yet here we are. Is Boris Johnson, you know, Teflon? What's going on? It is extraordinary because not only that, um, and the Wakefield by-election, I think, can be put down to the kind of uh, the numbers of the swing uh, which took the seat from the Conservative Labour, uh, I think probably could be put down to sort of mid-term blues. But that Tiverton and Honiton by-election, which was extraordinary, essentially overturning a 27,000 uh, Liberal Democrat deficit to the Tories in favour of a Liberal Democrat majority of about 6,000. I mean, that's, that's horrendous. Not, that's not mid-term blues. Um, and the reaction from that... And it's all been weird because Boris Johnson has been on the biggest overseas, longest overseas trip since the 1970s. So there he is. Off, uh, off. <laughs> he is not here and not facing his MPs. But I've been talking to lots of the rebels, some of the 148 that voted against him in that vote of no confidence in the last couple of days, just to, to take the temperature on the mood. Um, and amongst that rebel group, it's actually, they're quite down, they're quite mm. depressed. They don't see what they could do. There's no plan, there's no timetable, there's no mechanism for getting rid of him, there's no successor still. They're not sure whether the Privileges Committee inquiry into whether he lied, more details of which we had today, there'll be hearings uh, in September, is going to deliver what they want to see. Uh, and they don't see what else there could be. It may be that you have to wait 11 months for another vote of no confidence. And then and that, you're almost in general election territory. And that will be the argument that Boris Johnson mm -hmm. uh, and his team rely on at that point to try and get through. Boris Johnson gets through day to day, but the rebels are thinking it's quite a successful technique. It's interesting, isn't it? Do you think it, we would have had a different outcome if... Um, actually, we don't have time, Sam. I'm sorry, I'm no, told in my No, the answer to that question. No, no, it wouldn't be a different outcome. Interesting Correct. stuff. You read my mind. Sam Coates there. That is it for The Take. We will be back next week. Another very pacey show. <laughs> Every week as well. Wednesday at 9pm. Next up, it's Sky News at 10.